I think we have everyone, so hi. Uh, my name's Thomas Murphy, and uh, <laughs> this is the first slide on the Google Slides, so you can tell I put a lot of time into making the front page for this. A little bit of context about who I am. My name's Thomas Murphy. I gave a talk last year about Marvel and about how I quit my job and I'm making a game using Blender. So context me, I'm from Brooklyn. Uh, I live with my wife, my wife, Marielle Frank. There she is, she's awesome. I have two cats, Ham and Fish. And now I have a dog named Daisy. I like to add that stuff just because. And I'm making a game in the Blender game engine. Cue the collective eye roll. <laughs> I'm sure everyone's gonna be thrilled to hear that. That's 2.79 and not even B. So I get, I put a lot of stuff up on Twitter and I share everything that I'm doing and I get this comment a lot. I actually, I got it just before this talk started. So the, gen, the game engine's dead, right? It's dead, right? It's dead. So what does that mean exactly? Does that mean that it's no longer working or it's no longer functioning? Uh, it's no longer supported. And that the developers, the Blender developers have chosen not to support it for pretty good reasons. Uh, it's kind of complicated to maintain. There's not too many users, all the, uh, a lot of them users. There's quite a few, but you know, it hasn't really gained a lot of momentum. And there's a lot of other open source projects that are doing a very good job at it as well. So it's, it's not entirely necessary to, uh, everyone, let's welcome Finn. Here he comes. I'm calling him out. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, the, the, the point is um, it's not a unified workflow, but it's, there's other <laughs> game engines that are doing it better. But I still want to. Uh, make a game entirely in Blender, and I'm going to get into those reasons. Uh, so, I've been given all the usual warnings. Uh, you're wasting your potential if you stick with the Blender game engine. A lot of times I hear FOMO, a lot of people that want to get into games, uh, they think, oh, I need to get a job doing games. It needs to be tied to a pipeline. I need to be making money doing it. Um, so a lot of schools will say, you need to use Unity or Unreal or, or you know, insert blank here, and that's because you feel you won't be validated. That's another one that I really like. Um, and wouldn't you rather work with something that will give you a job skill? And my personal favorite that I get quite often through DM on Twitter is, lol, dude, you okay? Because a lot of people think that I'm having difficulty moving on from 2.79. <laughs> I am. <laughs> so this is a bit of a confessional, but also I love 2.8, and I actually use a lot of the tools, and I'll get into that as well. But first, Let's talk about the options. There's better options. These are some of the commercial options that we're all aware of. They're all really cool. Yay, they're fun. Um, some of them have better terms of service or EU LA um, uh, agreements that you have to sign or c agree to when you install the software. But I don't want to use these. I want it to be an open game. There's also open source engines. And I don't want to discount the wonderful work that these do. So there's Spring Engine, Panda, and Godot, which are also wonderful open source game tools. But there is a level of opacity between using these tools and Blender. You need to import and export the options. And typically, when you deliver these to a customer or a user, they're packed together. So I'm going to get into that later, but so I'm going back and forth a lot. So why should you listen to me, or why are you here? Um, some of you are my friends, which is great, but also, I come from the industry, so I know a lot. You can see it up there. It's true. Um, and you should definitely all listen to me, because I know more than you. No, he isn't aware of these things. I didn't even fully put that in there. Um, but I'm a power user in Blender, and I'm very familiar with the landscape of media and the effect that it has on people. And there's, there's, a, there's something not quite right with the games industry right now. Um, so I want to make an open game, and uh, I want to use it in Blender. So that's kind of a half-truth, and the reason is um, uh, you can't open and edit the files in Blender right now. You can't simply, uh, in a game, you can't get the files, open them up, and then look at them and edit things. So. I'm very familiar with controlling a narrative. And I'm sort of trying to control the narrative in this slide, but I messed up. So presentation skills 100. I definitely know what I'm doing. Uh, so I'm not really a role model if you want to get a jobs in the game industry, but I am making this game anyway. And it's, I guess you could say it's more for ethical reasons than it is necessarily for tying it to money, but because I want to make an open game. So 
I just wanted to get that out of the way to answer the question of what's wrong with me and why am I doing this, and there you go. So that's your answer. Um, and so I set to work working on a game in the Blender game engine. I've been working on it for over three years. And um, rather than talk more about it, I want to show the trailer because I'm a little proud of it. And it's got a lot of work in it. And it may not stand up to the industry, you know, all the shaders and all that cool stuff, but I'd like to show it. So I'm going to play it. Oh, right. Also, game industry, stop being so suspicious. Right now, they're, uh, the big games companies are a bit of a dumpster fire in terms of their PR. And this is partially why I think because they're not making open games and there's lots of microtransactions. I'll get into that. Moving on. Here's the trailer. All right, I have to press play. If you're playing this message, then there might still be time. Get out of these woods. Before the sun sets, there is someone or something evil here. We don't choose how we enter this world. If you stay in these woods after dark, Yeah, that's, that's the little trailer that I put together for it. Um, so uh, what's really impressive and I've, I'm really proud of is that that's an open world in the Blender game engine. And it's a lot of work, even though it may not seem up to standards of some of the bigger games out there. But um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And I want to say a personal thank you to all the Patreons, or patrons, I guess you call them patrons, that support me in this project because it's an open game. So I'm pretty sure that this, when I release it, I'm not going to be making millions, but these fine people all support me, and you can too, uh, if you want, and uh, I'm giving out a free poster if anyone wants, so there's a, there's, a, there's a personal plug right there. But that's why I created this little title card for the company that I'm making. <laughs> There it is. That's the uh, the intro. So when you start the game, you'll see that logo. And it's all about making a game where everyone shares. And it's a game that comes out, and everyone will be able to open the files and see how they're made. And all of these fine artists, programmers, musicians, and animators have actually contributed to the game. Um, I, I was told it's, it's important to make the note that um, I have paid all of these people to work on this. So this is not some sort of free project, but something I've really put uh, a lot of myself and my money behind. Um, so, as also another way of saying thank you, I make a little animated creature tulpa for every you, everyone that's helped with the game. Some of them are not finished yet because it takes a little bit of time to make them, but sort of to digitally immortalize people that support and um, create content for the game, um, they get their own little personal animal. And they're all over the world, so the lead programmer of here, Tim Krellin, is a tiger, and Lori Annis is a, she's from Arizona and she's a scorpion. It's fun having fun. So I also want to say a special thank you to Tim Krellin, the programmer who is very familiar with the Blender API and gave me a real boost. So I'm going to give him three Mr. four Mr. Goopies and you can give him a follow on Twitter or YouTube. He's great. Uh, so the game, how did I make the game? It's a horror game and it's intentionally a horror game because you can't use too many light sources in the Blender game engine. You can only use like five or six. So I was like, okay, we're going to work in darkness. Sounds good. Other things that you have to work with. Uh, 
Well, here, this is, an unlim this is an open world. This is cool. So what this is using is using matrix transforms in the Blender game engine. And uh, in order to make this, I had to develop a special add-on that works independently. Also, you'll be able to see the add-on if you have the game. And um, it works with no lag, which is very important. So the next step here was to create the same thing, but now add objects to the game. So the Blender game engine has another limitation. You cannot add more than a few objects. There's, it, the more objects you have, the slower things operate. So here we're using multiple transforms again, but they're all being massively shared. So if there's a, us there's a single user block, that means that this tree is being repeatedly shared, but with different scaling, rotation, and transforms. So this is a kind of clever way, and a lot of game engines do this, but when I did it in the Blender game engine, it allows me to own it, and I'd be pr I'm proud of how I created it, and there's full transparency. You can see everything. Like you can just open this up and play with it yourself. Finally, this is it working with level of detail and uh, parallax terrain block. It's kind of dark right now. Not, not too many lights in this game. But it's running at 60 frames per second, so it's pretty fantastic. Um, the next thing I want to do was I didn't see too many compelling... Uh, there's a lot of games on the Blender game engine that you know they seem kind of dated, but you can't make very current-looking characters. So I reached out to um, three random people on Twitter and Louis Womble on Instagram and asked them to just design a vampire. Just, come on, make one. Make one up, like a scary monster. So these are the ones they came back with. The two bookends are the ones I made. And the ones in the middle are made entirely by artists. So I've been very agnostic in this project where I don't steer people. I just, it's literally feral. <laughs> it's like herding cats. You just say, make one. And then I polled people, and it seems that the one on the far right was the most popular. So we went with that. Uh, so I made a mood board. That's this. We're using some celebrities back there. I don't want to call whoever that is. But And then these are all just examples of texture and Nosferatu and characters that would kind of, um, you know, make you think that this is what the monster would look like. So I worked with Gabby Haga, um, who's one of my, one of the contributors to the game, and this is, she wanted to model the vampire. She said she can do it, and I said, I believe you, let's go. So she did. So this is actually our back and forth. So she's from Mexico, and um, you can see that she, the, 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 the breast started out a little too perky, and we worked backwards from there. And uh, we just had feedback. So. A, over a period of four weeks, we worked on a character model. You can see I'm very um, harsh with my criticism. Oh my god, this is amazing. Oh my god, this is amazing. Cool. So you can see I really like to kick over people's sandcastles. <sighs> Here's the hand that we worked on. And I said, you know, it's great. Could we put claws on it? And we did. So that's the rigged hand on the right over there. It's a little bit of a creepy shot. We worked on the face. And this is when she began texturing it with substance. So. Substance is a really wonderful tool, and it's excellent, but it's not open source, so more on that in a minute. I did a overlay on top of the face to see if it looked sufficiently spooky, so I just put some blood on it, and I was like, yeah, it looks like a spooky monster. Okay, cool, boom, nice. So I made two shaders. Uh, this, is the, this is all in the Blender game engine, so this is the top layer shader and the lower shader, and then there's just the mesh breakdown so you can see what it looks like. And um, this, is all, this is just a screen recording. So all of these are screen recordings in the Blender game engine. Um, they look they look passably good. I, I, I kind of like them. Uh, we also did some extra work on the head to get a few more details to make it look scarier, I guess. And then it was a matter of making the character interactive, interactive and appear, you know, believable and look good. So on the left, that's actually in the open world, even though it's all pitch black in the background. Not too many lights in the Blender game engine. And here you can see there's head tracking. So this is the testing environment for the vampire and to see if we can get her to function. So this is, is working. And this is the player control system that Tim Crellin worked on as well. This is her first walk in the open world. And lastly, you saw hair on the monster. So you can't do particles and hair. So I, similar to Unity, I kind of hacked the, um, the nodes in the Blender game engine and subtracting the, the Y vector from the UVs of these planes and passing a cloud texture along it you get to add that back to the UVs, and then that creates displacement or distortion that makes it look like hair is waving. So you get some waving hair, and that's how it's achieved in the Blender Game Engine. These are typical tricks that sometimes come into play also in Unity and Unreal. They're just, they're kind of locked into the engine, and when a player plays it, they don't have access to all these things, and you can't see it. So this is the final product, again, just her hanging out in the dark. You can also see in the background, that's that's mist, that's a mist pass, but also it's using a similar trick where it's foggy mist, but it's animated. But it's all tied to the same animation driver, so as the, the wind speed picks up, so will, will her hair. So it's kind of fun like that. You can see how it works. 
And of course, oh my gosh, the bugs. There's so many bugs in Blender Game Engine. Um, it's because, you know, it, it's not fully supported and there's, there's a lot of gaps. So the up Blender Game Engine is a really good answer to that. And I tried using it quite a few times, but there was actually quite a few gaps in it. But these are two of my favorite bugs, which are the jitter bug. So I found out in an open world, the further you get from the origin, and this is the same in a lot of games, you start going crazy. You start just going nuts. And I thought that was a really good fear mechanic. It's a feature or a bug, you can decide, but um, it's, it's super weird. Um, and I didn't know what it was happening for the, the longest time, because you just, if you're, if you're approaching this as an, art, as an art project, you don't really understand the underpinnings of game engines and all that kind of stuff. So I kind of learned it organically. After I finished the, solved the, um, the jitter bug, it created a new bug, I call it the launch bug. So when you're set back to player origin, because the physics are always active, without suspending dynamics, you'll simply be launched for the crime of walking through the game. So here's the player getting launched into space. Also, could be fun, I guess. It could be like a feature of the game. Um, again, you can, I'm certain that if, with, with your build of the game, you could make these, these bugs happen easily. And that kind of leads me to the assets of the game, because that's one of the biggest parts of a video game, and the main reason I did it in the Blender Game Engine. I want people to be able to open it, and also, all, most games, they have um, their content locked down. Even open source games, if you want to use content that was made by somebody else and sold on like Turbo Squid or Blender Market or, or a stock photo, these are all, you can't redistribute them. That means that every item in this game was made either by me or someone I paid to make it because I couldn't purchase a stock photo, just a simple tree photo even, because that if I launch this game and release it, that's me redistributing those assets. And that's a violation of uh, <laughs> the legal agreement when you purchase stock asset. So it has to be kind of packaged into the software that you're using. So this is an example of the tarot card deck. So this is all high poly. The Grim Reaper here, he's reaching for the card deck. And the conceit of the game is that you will get to face any monster you want in the game. And he picks the monster from this card deck. So he's high poly and all made in Blender, and also this is high poly. And when it came time to deploy this for real time, I simply bake the high poly model in the same file down to a low, low poly mesh. So that's the tarot card deck. So it's very malleable workflow, and it's, it's, it's entirely unified, which is a, it's a very unique, and it's only something that my game has. Another example, and this is, um, this is again available in most game engines. You can change object color and use vertex painting. Uh, but this is directly available in Blender, the tool you'd be creating with ostensibly anyway, so why not just keep it in Blender? Here it is. So this is me toggling the level of details on and off, and also you can see the colors are fluctuating. That's just the object color. So based on the object color, based on where you are in the game, these milk crates will change color, so they can be reused in the same environment without using any extra memory, and it's dynamic, so it's pretty cool. It, it's a very fun workflow. So again, another example here is if you get really close to some of these assets, you can see how they're made, and they're really detailed and complicated, and usually this takes a lot of time and investment. So people that make independent games, an individual doesn't have time to do all this. So I did the crazy thing and just went ahead and took the time to do it. Um, so this is the vehicle in the game that the players will be able to drive. Um, another fun thing is the animation is built directly in as well. So you can see the file, the working file here, and then the actual gameplay footage right over here and how it marries up. So one of the more fun things for me is always, if you ever see a game, you get to see how it works behind the scenes and how it's broken. A lot of people like that. And games are sort of not having that anymore. You can't, it, they're getting harder to break. But it's really fun to see how it's created. And you could edit the animation and then save the file and then make that part of the permanent experience on your desktop. So here, here she is spawning from a basement. So these are portals, so the monster will spawn from various places in the game. And this is just an example of her spawning in the game. Again, this is also in the open world, but you're downstairs. So it's not as impressive. This is another challenge that the Blender game engine has. And this also doesn't exist for most games, which is the player needs to be mounted onto objects. So usually with mesh deformed objects in the Blender game engine, they cannot be synced with solid objects that are parented to it. So if there's a cube parented to an armature in the Blender game engine, it'll appear out of sync with the armature modifier. So to get around that, I worked within the constraints of the game engine, which is to create two separate armatures and then mount them to each other. So the armature of the arms match with the armature of the door, which is also a mesh modifier. So that actually hurts performance, but you can limit that. These, these, these only update 
when you animate it. It's kind of weird. So here's another example. The arms are interacting with the window, which is also has an armature. That's what the black line is right at the top up there. So um, you can now transfer these mounting points from the player interacting with things to getting caught by the vampire. So there's an example. Oops, she got you. Oh, that's the vampire. That's how she gets you. So, um, And this is the mounting system, basically. Yeah. Another interaction system is when physics-based objects that don't need armatures can be interacted with. This is some gameplay inside of the house. And you can pick up any item, toss it, toss it around to distract the monster or to use them, the item. So this is um, the inventory and the items that the player can pick up. It's pretty dull, I guess. I'm just showing this. But uh, you can see the interactivity. I threw some garlic on the couch. That's, that's cool. Yep, you can do that. So, again, there's just an insane amount of items in this game. Uh, lots and lots of unique items from uh, Blender in the Blender game engine, right down there in the left corner. It's called the Blenderizer. Um, and most of these items were either made by other artists or myself. Um, down in the bottom left-hand corner, you can actually see the cards that will morph in and out. And these are using environmental effects, tricks that are also available in the Blender game engine. So, or unique assets like this. So this is just a single asset. And what I committed myself to doing was the most boring assets. So I went to other artists and said, you want to make something cool? And they're like, yes, of course. So Gabby Hager did the vampire. Um, Zysef, um on Twitter got to, Ruman Belov, he got to make the weapons, which is something that a lot of people tend to like to make in 3D. And no one really wants to make a microwave. So this is a hotel microwave that I made. It was really boring. And, and, but, you know, these are the things that need to get made, but are n very often purchased and therefore very difficult to distribute in an open game. Um, and, of course, this will yield very fun results. So here's actually the player, and you can open the file and just kind of do weird stuff. So this is just to show the versatility of the workflow and how I can open things up and look inside. And, you know, it's creepy. She might or might not be a vampire. Um, moving on. That's weird. Just another asset. So you may notice that this one has texture painting on it. Um, and I'm going to get to that in just a minute. We're gonna, this is a bed made by Gabby Haga. So you can hide under the covers. <coughs> it's fun. And uh, here's other tricks that you can utilize. So in the Blender game engine, this chair is bilaterally symmetrical. It's the same on the left and the same on the right. So I can use two UV maps with saving texture space. So there's a small... There's a small texture of just normals that defines the geometry and how the light bounces off, and then the lighting, the ambient occlusion map. So these are really fun tricks that I can get away with in the Blender game engine. Here's a few other items made by Lorianis. Um, the front door of the house um, that can be massively reused throughout the level. And here's some neat um, flame effects. It's just a simple billboard that tracks the player. And um, all made, there's the high poly model and the low poly model next to it. Uh, in the game engine. There's environmental effects like fire and being burnt away and this kind of, I guess, glowy light, you call it. These are similar tricks in all game engines, of course. <coughs> a procedural sky. This was baked to a skybox, but also there's procedural, um, there's also procedural noise in this game engine as well, which is actually pretty neat and not a very well-known feature. Also procedural water. So the water itself is using parallax mapping for the, uh, the ground, and then there's distortion, and here's a better shot of that. So you can, and Simon Tom's helped me make this, but you can simply edit this live. So if you had a copy of the game, you could open the file up and then play with this, which is kind of fun. <coughs> Moving on. Here's just another noise shader. Here's a parallax shader so you can get really cool detail results. So again, this is me working within the constraints of the Blender game engine to sort of get away with making a more visually compelling game. So this is parallax. There's, there appears to be depth, but it's a simple plane. Uh, again, here's more parallax. Um, the, wicker, the wicker pattern on the basket is just a simple low poly basket, but it appears to have lots of detail because I'm taking advantage of the powerful shaders in the Blender game engine. Uh, this is Venetian cane, I guess. I don't know, it's another wicker pattern, so that shows up too. Cool. And here's the open world being used with all the parallax and s all the neat stuff. So this is running at 60 frames per second on my 1080. So it may, it may drag on other systems, but there it is. 
here's another example of a high-res texture being reused over and over again to create more detail. So you can share massively textures throughout the game. <coughs> this is some gameplay footage of the Grim Reaper um, dealing some cards. So you can see this is an actual isolated scene in the game that also takes place in the open world. And he shuffles the cards, he deals the cards, you pick your fate, yeah, there you go, that's how it works. So it's, it's kind of like, it's very neat to be able to see this and game, big games don't have this. They, there's, a, there's, this there's this wall between you and the interaction. You'd have to, there's usually an aggressive microtransaction kind of thing that would happen. You'd have to purchase this or something like that. But you can just jump in here and change things around. You could change the picture of the monster to, I don't know, a picture of a cat. Um, speaking of monsters, introducing Mr. Goopy. So this is um, a door, but also it's showcasing the AI stand-in. So it's kind of scary to work on a game all by yourself. So I made Mr. Goopy here. And to test the AI in a, in a horror game at night in the dark actually is pretty scary, believe it or not. It kind of starts to wear you down. So I made him to test this AI. Here's the AI functioning. It's using a, um, an A-star pathfinding algorithm. It's the, uh, the standard pathfinding that comes in the Blender game engine, actually. It's just right there. So you can actually edit it. And here you can see he's, he's coming for you. <coughs> so um, the last time he sees you is the, is the little green ball. If you get out of that sphere of his line of sight for more than five seconds, he'll investigate and then go back to searching other points of interest. So he kind of relentlessly got me there. So that's kind of on a loop there. But that's Mr. Goopy, and he's been very helpful. He's my friend because it's lonely working on a game all by yourself in a room uh, just on his own. Also, I've been able to exploit vehicle physics. So I also inadvertently made a really kind of fun off-road game too. So there, you can drive a car away, which is kind of the, the conceit of the game again, which is also wish fulfillment. If you want to change any file, you can. If you'd like to get in a car and drive off into the interstate, you can also do that. So you can just get on the road and drive miles away. And you can do that. That's fun. Or you can just get out of the car. Here's an example of me attempting and failing to distract the vampire. So this is the AI testing bed with the vampire. I took her textures off because she's less scary that way. But I'm basically failing to uh, distract her right now. So bringing it all together, this is a shot of the game. This is, what it, this is representative of the final footage. There she is looking for you. And I'm just going to jump in this closet here. So this very small section takes tons and tons of work. And it's not like a lot of the stuff that we at Blender usually tend to see, which is like you're usually working with just whatever is in the frame of the camera, and you got all your compositing, and it looks great. But to make a whole game, especially exclusively in the Blender game engine, it's very difficult and kind of mind-numbing. And this is the result of years of work just to get this functioning. So it's actually, there's a forest outside. Take my word for it. But um, it's, it's a lot more work than I initially, initially thought it would be. But it's just on a loop now, so I'm going to change the slide. <coughs> So what's the plan? Like, it's because like, I'm making an open game. That seems nuts. And you're just going to give it all away, and then people can open it up and do stuff with it. Yep, pretty much. Um, that's it. Um, that's the plan. So how does it work? Uh, well, you could maybe buy it from me. I'm probably going to put it on itch.io or gum road, and then you'll have access to the file. So it'll go to your hard drive, and then you can open it with Blender. You can also open these files with Blender 2.8. No guarantee whether that will then work again with Blender 2.7, because it's a different system. But if you support me on Patreon, here, you'll have the knowledge of knowing that I will be in a dark corner somewhere continually working on the game. How does that work? That's weird, right? It's Because this is also kind of software as a service. I know that's in the news these days, or some people that are aware of games are aware of that. But mine's a little different. So, and this is an example here. You're walking through the open world, and it's very sparse. And that's because they're all massively shared assets. I will be working remotely constantly just updating the information of the levels. So the next time you visit this same place, it could appear flush like this. And that's because I'm constantly publishing and republishing using my add-on updated um, information. So basically the game can grow and grow and get better and better and you'll be able to see its progress and track its progress while I work on it. And also eventually it'll hopefully come to a state where it'll appear indistinguishable from a AAA game. That's kind of the goal. It's, it's really ambitious and kind of uh, might be the hill I die on. But you guys can be my, become my patrons and watch me die on that hill. So here's an example of me just warping around the entire environment, checking things out really quick. And uh, I'll just jump over here. That massive amount of assets. So there's tons of them in there. You may also wonder why 
how I could do all this even in three years. There's a lot of them. And uh, while I did get a lot of help, I also cheated. So if anyone knows Lubos' project, Armory and Armor Paint, I am using Armor Paint. And that's a really good tool that I le recommend a lot of people use. So Armory is also a game engine. And that pr promises a future life for my game on other devices, which will be deployed to mobile, uh, Mac, every device basically, Android, iOS, all that stuff. And here's just a really quick example of being able to use Armor Paint, which is just like um, uh, Substance Designer, except the, the, the features are very threadbare, and some of the, the normal features aren't there, like baking for uh, normals are currently not available. Uh, and this is just a video of me quickly going through and filling in those gaps, and then I take it back into Blender and I bake the normals back in Blender. So I'm using this now. And if you are interested in learning how to do Substance Designer and get better, I recommend you use Substance Paint because it will grow with you, and as you learn these new features, you'll have a tool that supports you, and there's no expensive Creative Cloud membership also. So definitely use Ar Armor Paint. I'm using it, and I'm making huge gains in um, progress, and it's much faster. So here's two items that were made in substance by Gabby Haga. They're wonderful. Um, and here's Armor Paint. These are also made in Armor Paint. And this is a knife made in Armor Paint. And here's a couch made in armor paint. So normally something texturing and something like this in Blender could take a day or two days. Um, this took me about an hour. You just whip it out and just model it up really quick. So you can get a lot done really quickly with substance and also armor paint. And uh, here's an example of the whole scene with everything made in armor paint except for this, which is obviously the comparison as is made in substance. So you can see that things look of equal quality pretty much and it's great. Um, so for the future, um, this is a very frightening version of the game. This is uh, me uh, in the process right now of porting parts of the game over to Armory, so it'll be able for ev it'll be available for every system, like iOS and everything. And it'll obviously be able to have more lights too, which is great. But right now, it currently exists in the Blender game engine uh, as an open game. Also, here's another example of procedural water that exists right out of the box in Armor Armory. So I suggest getting to use Armory. It's like a really good idea. Um, also, in interest of time, I think I'm done. Or I don't know if I am. I don't know. What time is it? Uh, 16.31. I think Tom Tan had the wisdom of making this talk, like the last talk in the salon. And in, in the interest of giving up the, um, the narrative, uh, I'm also leaving time if anyone has any questions or if anyone wants to yell at me and tell me I'm very, very wrong. Um, any questions? Yes, I'm not doing it. I'm doing it in. Um, oh, that's a really good question. Uh, the question was, um, why am I not doing it in Godot instead of and using Armory? And that's because, again, um, I I want the files that are in the game to also be available to artists, so people that are interested in playing games can then also edit those. One of the more odious things about the gaming industry um, is that. There's microtransactions where a simple action, a creative action, is limited from the user and you will be charged $5 to change the color of a hat. I feel like that's, that's very limiting and kind of, you know, it, it tends to prey on well, people, impressionable children, um, like gambling mechanics and all that kind of stuff. I don't want to date this talk by calling out individual companies, but you just Google it. You'll, you'll find stuff. It's fun. So that's why I'm doing it, um, even though it may not be the greatest business model. Any other questions? Okay, it's getting hot here. Okay, thank you guys very much. Yeah.